Steve Terrence, and I'm the director of the British Law Centre here at the University of Warsaw. The BLC, as we are lovingly known, has been here since 1992. So, for those of you who are better at maths than me, wow, that's the, the most instant impact I've ever had. <laughs> I'm leaving immediately. I don't listen to people called Steve. Uh, this is our 25th anniversary this year. And as part of that, those anniversary celebrations, then we're organizing a series of guest lectures from very prominent legal experts, including the lectures tonight and tomorrow. Now, since I have an attentive audience, is something that lecturers love, it would be remiss of me. I would not be able to sleep this evening if I didn't tell you that our beloved British Law Centre, as well as celebrating its anniversary, has also just begun its second round of recruitment. Now, if you'd like to take a look at our, our banner over there and the web page, or for those of you who are friendly with the internet, you can like us on Facebook, share. It all sounds a bit strange, I think, asking people to like you. It sounds a bit desperate, but that's, that, that is the language of Facebook, I'm afraid. Find us, British Law Centre, and you will see that we're beginning a catch-up course so for those who began in October and are finishing in December this year, their first semester, we're going to do catch-up classes for new people who are joining from today up until the end of December. We'll do those catch-up classes in January and February. You can find a full timetable on our webpage, or you can get to it through Facebook. So, zachęcam bardzo, żebyście czytali, sprawdzali, and uh, this is the end of my sales pitch. Okay. It's not quite the end. What is the diploma about? Well, it's not just substantive law, both English and European law, but we also teach a range of legal skills during those, the modules that we teach. So check it out, and I'm sure you'll be happy. Pan będzie zadowolony, pana będzie zadowolona, obiecuję wszystko będzie dobrze. Okay, um, now, with that over, uh, I'd like to begin uh, with some thank yous, and the first thank you is a very brief one because I'd like to say thank you to the Dean of Okręgowa Rada Adwokacka w Warszawie, uh, Dean Mikołaj Kerczak, and I'd like to invite Mikołaj to come and say uh, a few words if you would like. It's no, notoriously hard act to follow. So. <laughs> um, thank you, Steve. Um, so, Bernard, thank you, above all, for agreeing to come to speak with us. Um, I feel very intimidated today because I realize I'm well, I'm well out of my depth. I have contract interpretation in the civil and continental and common law uh, legal systems. The last time I dealt with contract law involved uh, uh, a, a fraud case uh, and uh, a ton of cocaine. So I don't, I'm, 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 you know, I'm quite out of my depth. Um, I, I would like to say that you have the privilege of participating in something very precious. I uh, was one of those who participated in the uh, initial Cambridge courses, uh, which are continued today by uh, the British Law Centre about 25 years ago. I just displayed my age. And uh, back then, it was just as important, or perhaps uh, even more so than it is today, but still extremely important today. Uh, you're participating in uh, the possibility of uh, seeing other legal systems, how they function. We no longer have the privilege of performing legal work in a strictly domestic setting. All the legal work we do, whether we're doing contract law, uh, defense work regarding the ton of cocaine, <laughs> Or family law, commercial law, uh, intellectual property, it's all transnational these days, it's all transjurisdictional. Uh, you will sooner or later encounter transjurisdictional issues. And as uh, lawyers who wish to represent their clients to the fullest possibilities, you need to be aware of how that uh, transnationality of your work will affect your cases. That requires an understanding of how these systems collide. So I think the talk that chosen by Sir Bernard Briggs today for the lecture is au uh, courant. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity to broaden our horizons. And I can only 
uh, enjoying and thanking uh, Sir Bernard uh, for taking the time to speak with us today. And I'd also like to thank the British Law Center and Clifford Chance uh, for giving us the opportunity to cooperate with them in uh, setting up today's lecture. Thank you very much. Before I hear you all say, oh, boy, uh, I'd just like to reiterate uh, two extra special thanks uh, that I, I think you really need to, to pay attention to. First is a huge thanks to Clifford Chance, who have been an incredible supporter of the British Law Centre since its, its very first days and continue to be. Supporting our day-to-day -day bread and butter work of teaching a diploma, but also in terms of supporting our moot court competition that we run, and in terms of helping us to run special events such as today's and tomorrow. So we're delighted to have some of the chances representatives here, and sincerely, thank you very much. Finally, of course, the, the greatest thanks go to Sir Bernard Briggs, who it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce. Sir Bernard has so many accomplishments, posts, functions on his CV, and I'm sure probably two or three times as many that never made it onto the CV, that it would be a lecture in itself to merely run you through uh, the entire CV. So this will be very brief, and I mentioned, but a small sample. Uh, Sir Bernard had an extremely successful career as a commercial barrister. He was made a Queen's Counsel in 1981, and for those of you who have not done the British Law Centre, Queen's Counsel essentially means super barrister. Uh, from 1981. He then became a, a judge, uh, a high court judge, and sat predominantly in the commercial court. He then became the head of the commercial court and was instrumental in implementing extremely significant reforms to civil procedure in the largest commercial court in, in the UK. Um, he then became a judge of the Court of Appeal in England and Wales. And although he's now retired from that post, he continues to sit as a judge of the Court of Appeal in the Cayman Islands. Now, if people haven't been envious of your career so far, then surely that one has gone. <laughs> uh, and also in Singapore, he sits as, as an extremely successful arbitrator and mediator, including at the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. And on top of all of that, he's also a professor of international commercial law at Queen Mary University of London. There is probably nothing that Sir Bernard hasn't done if it comes to commercial law, so I will not take up a single more second of the time that could otherwise be used by Sir Bernard. I want to say we're delighted that you've joined us. Thank you sincerely, and welcome to Warsaw. Thank you very much indeed. Panie et panowie, dobry wieczór. <laughs> That's as good as it gets. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be asked to speak at this famous university and to do so on a, on a theme which has come to interest me more and more as I've drifted from the quieter domestic waters of English litigation to the choppier seas of international arbitration. The theme uh, is the differences and similarities of the common and civil law approaches to contract interpretation. So today I would like to examine those traditions, first in principle, and then by reference to two cases, which I think allow for interesting insights into the different approaches of the two traditions. One of those cases is a maritime case, which arose out of an arrest in a French port an agreement for the release of the vessel, the provision of security, and the resolution of the dispute under French law in the English courts. And the other is a construction dispute, which went to international arbitration and was subsequently the focus of enforcement proceedings in both the English and the French courts. So first let me consider the two traditions of the common and the civil law. I will begin with the common law and then go on with the civil law, I don't think that there are important differences between the various nations which practice the common law, but I will concentrate on the common law as it is found in England. When we say England, we should say England and Wales, 
the Scotland principles of jurisdiction. Now, the principles of the common law may have been formulated over time in slightly different ways, but I don't believe myself that these differences, although sometimes spoken of as being revolutionary, are in truth fundamental. What does change over time is the spirit of interpretation, the spirit. And that spirit sometimes waxes more literal and sometimes waxes more purposeful. Some generations have been caught up more with the meaning of words, and some generations are more willing to be guided by the purpose of the contract. And that division between what have been called the literal goats and the purposive sheep, I don't know why uh, sheep are more valuable than goats, but it's a uh, biblical um, reference, and people will be wiser than I am about that. That battle, that division, is the modern battleground of interpretative disputes, and I will return to that subject later. First, however, I will address the primary rules of interpretation, what might be described as the common law equivalent of the Unidwa principles, which seek those principles which seek to encapsulate the civil law approach to the interpretation of international and commercial contracts. Now, the universal purpose, of course, is to ascertain the common intention of the parties. But that is to be done in England by an objective rule of interpretation rather than by seeking what the parties were intending subjectively. The English view is, is that because it is the common intention of the parties which counts, it follows that their individual subjective intentions are irrelevant. What counts is what they have said or written to one another as expressive of their intentions. And that language is to be interpreted for what it would convey to reasonable people positioned as the contract parties were at the time of their contract. And thus the primary rule has been expressed in modern jurisprudence as follows, quote, interpretation is the ascertainment of the meaning which the document will convey to a reasonable person having all the background knowledge which would reasonably have been available to the parties in the situation in which they were at the time of the contract. Now that, quote, is the first of five principles which Lord Hoffman, one of our most distinguished uh, judges in, in our Supreme Court, before that in the House of Lords, as we used to call our Supreme Court, and that's the first of five principles which Lord Hoffman set out in his judgment in Investors' Compensation Scheme and West Bromwich Building Society. I have um, uh, provided a handout uh, which I hope is, has been made available to you, uh, which has set out the five principles uh, of Lord Hoffman from the Investors' Compensation Scheme case. And if you've got that handout to hand, if you'll be able to read these principles for yourself as I track through them. Now, the principle which I've just cited was what Lord Hoffman considered to be the primary rule, and the rest might be said to be commentary. When Lord Hoffman formulated his five principles, it was thought by some that this marked a revolution in our interpretative principles. And that was in 1998. But now, only uh, the other year, in Arnold and Britain, the Supreme Court has produced another so-called revolution. And in Lord Newberger's leading judgment in that case, there is not even mention of the investors' compensation scheme case. That's how our jurisprudence works. And with that warning, I think it's nevertheless instructive to take it in stages. And this involves, in effect, the history of contract interpretation in England in our own times. So let's take a minute to deconstruct Lord Hoffman's primary rule. You'll note a number of things. First, the parties and their intentions have been disembodied. The parties are not central, the central person is the reasonable interpreter. That is typical of the common law, which save where honesty is in question, always seeks to objectify the problem. Where, of course, honesty is in question, you have to look into the mind of the person and ask, have they been honest or dishonest? But honesty apart, 
when you're dealing with contract interpretation, the matter is entirely objectified. Two, the reasonable interpreter is no longer if uh, he ever was, but if, as he has sometimes been expressed to be in English jurisprudence, quote, the man on the Clapham omnibus. I think nowadays one would talk about the woman on the underground. Or in truth, because we are talking about uh, really contract interpretation in the commercial context, as I say to my students in London, we are all commercial lawyers, aren't we? We're not, we're not consumer lawyers, we are com uh, commercial lawyers. Uh, and so I think we would neither talk about the man on the platform omnibus, nor the woman on the underground, but we would talk about um, the businessman in the taxi, or the businesswoman in the taxi. Uh, three, the party's knowledge at the time of, uh, of contract is often referred to as the matrix of the contract. Don't ask me what the matrix is. I think it's um, I think it's the, something which holds the central canes of a paperweight or something like that. That's the matrix of the paperweight. Anyway, the matrix uh, is that background knowledge and aspiration which is mutual to the parties. Because the primary rule of objective interpretation, the court is only interested in what is known or ought to be known mutually to the parties. Fourthly, the emphasis is on the time of contract. Therefore, the courts are not interested in how the parties may conduct themselves to one another after the contract has been made. Post-contractual conduct is sometimes said to be entirely irrelevant to contractual interpretation. Pre-contractual conduct or negotiations are also irrelevant, but under a separate rule, Lord Hoffman's rule number three, to which I will come uh, shortly. So, both pre-contractual negotiation and post-contractual conduct are irrelevant to contractual interpretation. And fifthly, as so often in the common law, the rule is softened by the use of the word uh, reasonable, or the adverb reasonably. You will see both words appear in Lord Hoffman's primary rule. It again reflects the objective standpoint of the common law, but it permits the courts a degree of manoeuvre in an area which is, of course, by definition, otherwise entirely within the autonomy of the parties. <coughs> Lord Hoffman's third rule is one of the most distinct rules of English law and differs from the approach of the civil law. It is the exclusionary rule which prevents recourse to the parties' negotiations. Thus, to cite the rule, quote, the law excludes from the admissible background the previous negotiations of the parties and their declarations of subjective intent. They are admissible only in an action for rectification. The law makes this distinction for reasons of practical policy. Re an action for rectification. That's where some uh, mistake has been made in the drawing up of the contract, the parties have agreed on X, but by mistake, non-X, or Y, or Z, has been put into the contract. Simple example, the price of the contract is £10,000, but the secretary has added an extra note, and it's written as £100,000. Right? If there's a dispute, perhaps there isn't a dispute, but everyone agrees, yes, of course, we're talking about £10,000, you would have to, if there is a dispute, you would have to have an action for rectification. You would have to show that the agreement was for £10,000, that agreement existed right down to the time of signing the contract, and it's only by mistake that some other figure has been put in. That's rectification. Rectification, of course, is not interpretation. Now, this exclusionary rule, which excludes contract negotiations, was reconsidered by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom recently in a case called Chartbrook and Persimmon Homes in 2009, but the rule was reaffirmed. In the course of his judgment in Chartbrook, Lord Hoffman, Lord Hoffman again, contrasted the English rule with the rule in civil law jurisdictions. And he said this, quote, supporters of the admissibility of pre-contractual negotiations 
draw attention to the fact that continental legal systems seem to have little difficulty in taking them into account. But these instruments reflect the French philosophy of contractual interpretation, which is altogether different from that of English law. As Professor Catherine Valka explains in an illuminating article on comparing French and English contract law, Insights from Social Contract Theory, January 2009, French law regards the intention of the parties as a pure question of subjective fact, their volonté psychologique uninfluenced by any rules of law. It follows that any evidence of what they said or did, whether to each other or to third parties, may be relevant to establishing what their intentions actually were. English law, on the other hand, mixes up the ascertainment of intention with the rules of law depersonalizing the contracting parties and asking not what their intentions actually were, but what a reasonable outside observer would have taken them to be. Well, Hoffman went on to explain the English approach of excluding reference to pre-contractual negotiations. In effect, Lord Hoffman says that because the civil law is interested in subjective intent, it makes sense to look for it in the negotiations for the contract. Look for it wherever you can find it. From the common law point of view, however, Negotiations are not necessary as a source of the party's intentions, because no one is trying to look into their minds. And then a number of pragmatic reasons combine to produce a rule, centuries old in the common law, to exclude as generally unhelpful a rummage through all the detritus of negotiations. It is accepted that now and then a nugget of gold might be found but what Lord Hoffman called the chance of, quote, more precise justice in exceptional cases, end quote, is outweighed by the practical disadvantages of the general run of things. It's only in Lord Hoffman's fourth and fifth rules that he finally comes to talk of language as a source of meaning or intention. He said this, quote, the meaning of words is a matter of dictionaries and grammars. The meaning of the document is what the parties using those words against the relevant background would reasonably have been understood to mean. And then this, quote, the rule that words should be given their, quote, natural and ordinary meaning reflects the common sense proposition that we do not easily accept that people have made linguistic mistakes, particularly in formal documents. On the other hand, if one would nevertheless conclude from the background that something must have gone wrong with the language, the law does not require judges to attribute to the parties an intention which they plainly could not have had. It's, end quote. It's, it's to be observed that when Lord Hoffman comes to the parties' language, he refers to words and dictionaries. Of course, language is made up of words, but we all know that the meaning of words depends on their context, and that language merely interpreted through a dictionary with their lists of many different meanings would be a very unsatisfactory process and may be witnessed where an unskilled interpreter translates from one language to another by simply relying on a dictionary. I would therefore prefer to defer to the party's language rather than just to their words. But it has to be said that on occasions, taking a single word by itself, uh, dictionary meanings are looked at uh, by the English courts. Anyway, that is what the Supreme Court has now done in their recent 2015 case of Arnold and Britain. And this decision has gone back to enthroning language as the principal tool of interpretative principles. Lord Hoffman was rather concerned to downplay language as the principal interpretative tool. With Arnold and Britain showing the way in which common law jurisprudence is always a shifting pendulum, has gone back to language as being the essential um, first and primary tool of contract interpretation. The court was concerned to emphasize that purposive construction and the invocation of commercial common sense 
have to make way for the language in which the parties have expressed themselves. I give you a, a sample from Lord Newberger's judgment, Lord Newberger, the recently retired president of the UK Supreme Court. Quote, save perhaps in a very unusual case, that meaning is most obviously to be gleaned from the language of the provision. Unlike commercial common sense and the surrounding circumstances, the parties have control over the language they use in the contract. While commercial common sense is a very important factor to take into account when interpreting the contract, the court should be very slow to reject the natural meaning of the provision as correct, simply because it appears to be a very imprudent term for one of the parties to have agreed. Now one could debate, perhaps without profit, where one enters this net of doctrine. I would respectfully suggest that what is important to remember is the following eight points. The first, the autonomy of parties over their own contract means that one should always start with their own language and with due respect for it, particularly in formal contracts written by lawyers. Because we're all commercial lawyers here tonight. Two, although language is the tool of all of us, the parties contract against a private background of mutual knowledge and aspirations, which has to be taken into account. As long as it's mutual, it's common to the place. Three, the interpretative function of the courts is to find the parties' common intention from the objective viewpoint. Four, it follows that private knowledge and private intentions are of no relevance. Five, negotiations are excluded because they are regarded as generally being an unprofitable source for finding a common intention. Parties are negotiating with one another. One party says one thing, one party says the other thing. The language is always changing, the clauses are always changing. Finally, they only agree on the common language agreed, which goes into the executed contract. So why does it help you to go through all the drafts? Uh, six, the intention to be found is that of the date of the contract. Therefore, what comes after the contract can only be of assistance to the extent that it can throw light on a common intention at the time of contract. I think you will find um, expressions of distaste for looking at post-contractual conduct for any reason whatsoever uh, uh, expressed uh, at the highest level of authority. <coughs> For myself, I would uh, say that it's all right to do so, provided it throws light uh, on the common intention at the time of the contract. And that's something that the law does uh, on a number of occasions. It is prepared to look, as it were, at uh, current or future history to throw light on a past time. Seventh, where interpretive problems arise, the logic of the contract and its purposes will be highly instructive and may well be determinative. Eight, in any event, it is the contract as a whole and not just individual words in it which have got to be interpreted. And in, and in this respect, as has been said on many occasions, context is everything. Now, I said that uh, the great uh, division and battleground uh, in the common law was between the literalist goats and the purposive sheep. Uh, assuming that you are all judges this evening, who is a literalist goat? Hands up. One, two, Steve, Dave. Three, four, and who are purposive sheep? All the rest of you. Well, why allow yourself to be categorized? <laughs> don't be goats and don't be sheep. 
how can you interpret a contract without paying the highest regard the language? And how can you interpret the contract without paying the highest regard to purpose and context? How can you do it with one rather than the other? And how can you say that one is primary and the other is not? All you can say, really, is that you have to start with the language. I don't mean by that to say that it's primary, because it may not be. But you have to start with it. You can't start with what? A purpose, a context, which you don't know anything about until you've read the contract. And how can you read the contract except in language? It's written. So, don't be goats and don't be sheep. Be human beings. Let's now consider, uh, perhaps more briefly, as to hit the pit's mind, lesser familiarity to it, the civilian law approach to see where it is similar and where it differs from the approach of the common law. Now, the great and magnificently terse and elegant statement of the Code Napoleon, which is repeated in various languages in so many of the fundamental codes of civil law nations all over the world, and which has survived unchanged for over 200 years, until just the other day, just last year. Uh, I think the change came into effect in October 2016. Um, it's contained in Article 1156 in the English translation of Code Napoleon, which I have in my library at home. Article 1156 is rendered thus. Quote, in agreements, it is necessary to search into the mutual intention of the contracting parties rather than to stop at the literal sense of the terms. And in the original French, it reads, if you'll pardon my inadequate French pronunciation, but I've already shown you how bad I am at pronouncing foreign languages. On doit dans les conventions rechercher quelle a été la commune intention des parties contractantes plutôt que de s'arrêter au son littéral des termes. Uh, my uh, English translation at home is from uh, a, uh, what claims to be a first edition uh, into English of the Code Napoleon, uh, published in 1824. So it took 20 years for Code Napoleon, if that claimed to be the first edition of an English translation, it took 20 years for Code Napoleon time, even if the first 11 of those years were spent in the war between France and Britain. <laughs> anyway, let's pause for a moment over the wonderful wording of this wonderfully brief statement. It takes only two lines of text to make a number of critically important points. First, it refers to language, but with the warning that the interpreter must not stop at the literal sense of the terms. Pluto que de sa arite au son littéral des termes. Secondly, it follows although it's a matter of implicit interpretation rather than the express language, but one must at least start with the language, even if one does not stop with its literal sense. I'd say that at the very beginning. Third, what one must concentrate on, however, is what the article begins with, which is not the language of the contract itself, but the common intention of the parties. Four, that common intention, and I emphasize that as in the common law, it is of course the common intention of the parties which is referred to, is to be sought. The French word is recherche. And that suggests an active 
and compelling process for the search. It's a case of research, a digging out, a careful sorting out, in the sense in which, in English and no doubt in Polish too, one commonly talks of the search for truth. And fifth, in a very real sense, what Article 1156 tells you is that you must be careful not to be a literalist. Okay. Now that's a good note on which to return to the current tension between a literal and a purposive approach to interpretation. I would respectfully suggest, however, as I have already done, by asking you to vote as to which pen you are going to be put into, uh, it's a full dichotomy. There is, in my mind, no doubt that the interpreter has to take into account both the language adopted by the parties and the purposes for which they contract. And sometimes those purposes are usefully stated in the contract itself. Sometimes they have to be discovered by a process of analysis of the contract. And often, that analysis is the hardest and also the most important part of contractual interpretation. A purpose of construction will often enable the court to decide between two or more possible alternatives. But the weight to be ascribed to language and to purpose in any particular case can never be a matter of rule. The fascination of contractual interpretation is that each problem is a world of its own. And this is not only because each contract is different, but also because the causes of, dis of dispute vary. Sometimes the contract is deliberately ambiguous, because it's the only way the parties could reach agreement. You might find that the Brexit negotiations involve some ambiguous language in people. The parties themselves do not know how it is meant to operate in certain circumstances, even if they have their own often conflicting ideas about that. Sometimes the problem arises from a gap in the contract, because not everything has been foreseen or covered, or even thought as being necessary to state, perhaps because it was thought to be so obvious. And sometimes there are errors of draftsmanship, as where definitions are misdrafted <coughs> or references misstated. Sometimes there are errors of misunderstanding. And sometimes the contract simply does not provide for some unexpected turn of events. And then the way in which the contract operates in the new circumstances may be awkward. But the solution still has to be found in the contract itself. The, party, the courts, under their interpretative function, cannot make a new contract for the party. But it's often the case that in such circumstances, where the parties did not anticipate the problem that has arisen at all, that it's almost impossible to speak sensibly of a common intention of the parties, save in the most disembodied, or as we say in the common law world, objective sense. In such circumstances, since contracts are primarily about the allocation of risk, the courts have to make a judgment about where, in the light of the party's contract as a whole, the risk which has appeared out of nowhere and unexpectedly uh, was intended to fall. Now let me draw this section of my talk to a close by highlighting two linked points by way of contrast in common civil law approaches. First, the common law approach excludes, as you've heard me say, both pre-contractual negotiations and post-contractual performance as being relevant to the process of contract interpretation. Now, in both those respects, the civil law differs. You don't learn that from Article 1156, even in its amended version, 2016 version, that's all derived from the jurisprudence of the civil law, uh, which tells you that you 
can look at everything. You can look into contractors' minds. You can look at what I don't say the Polish law is entirely different. That's the Polish law, but certainly it's true of the civil law of many continental systems. Certainly true of France. You can uh, you can ask yourself, court can ask yourself, what has a contracted party told to a third party? Not not to his contract partner, but to a third party. What have you told the third party about this contract? Because that helps you to look into the contracting party's mind. But you can't do that in the common law. But the civil law differs because the civil law excludes absolutely nothing in its search for the intention of the parties. And as we know, and as I've just exemplified, uh, is even willing to take into account subjective intentions of the individual parties or what they have told the third parties in its attempt to discover the common intention of the parties. The second and linked point I would make, however, is that it always has to be remembered that the common law and the civil law differ in their procedure as well as in their substantive law. So, so far we've been talking about the substantive law of contract interpretation. But let me now say something about the procedure of the common and civil law. When it comes to procedure, the common law favors discovery or disclosure of documents on a substantial scale. And it also favors live cross-examination of witnesses. The civil law, as I understand it, favors neither in the contractual context. Now, if the civil law were to pursue the common intention of the parties in pre-contractual negotiations and post-contractual performance, by the common law procedure of extensive disclosure of documents and cross-examination of witnesses, then it would never get to the end of the matter. Every single document which the parties have brought into existence for the purpose of or in the context of, or in performance of their contract, would be potentially relevant for the purpose of finding out their intentions. Every document before the contract, and every document after the contract, in the forms of it, might give you a clue to contract interpretation. And if it's possibly relevant, then the English common law or procedure would say you have to give disclosure of those documents. And so every issue of contract interpretation would set up volumes and volumes of disclosure. Similarly, if the common law were to adopt the civil law approach to the interpretation of contracts and still retain its procedural liberality, it too would never get to the end of the matter. And so the civil law has an extensively speculative substantive law of contract interpretation that controls it by a more stringent approach to procedural opportunities, while the common law has a narrower approach to the substantive question of contract interpretation, in part, I suspect, if one looks at it historically, for the very reason that otherwise it would have to curtail its procedural approach to the search for truth. Now, having dealt with these general principles, let me now turn to two cases I mentioned at the outset. Just to, because they're both cases in which the common law court had to approach a problem under the civil law. The first is a case called the Spirit of Independence. I decided it in 1999 when I was sitting as a commercial judge in the commercial court concerned a vessel arrested in France by a shipyard for the cost of repairs done for the account of demise charterers. Demise charterers. Uh, demise charterers are charterers who have taken uh, a complete lease of the vessel. So most ships are chartered simply as a contract for services. The owner of the ship uh, retains possession of the ship. Uh, the captain of the ship is 
the owner's servant, the crew of the ship are the owner's servants, and the owner simply puts his ship at the disposal of the charterers and says, uh, within contractual limits, I will, I will take my ship where you want it to go, and I will load the cargo to you want it to load, and deliver them where you want them to be delivered. But a device charter is a complete lease of the ship, possession, uh, and complete control of the ship passed to the <coughs> charterers. And the owner is just um, like, a, like a property owner who has leased out his property uh, for someone to live in for the next seven years, let's say. So in, in this case, uh, the demise charterers needed some repairs done to the ship, and they had them done at the shipyard in France. And they didn't pay for the repairs. And so the shipyard claimed to have a maritime lien, a maritime claim against the charterers under the uh, Maritime Arrest Convention, which is an international convention, uh, which had been directly incorporated into French law. The vessel was released from arrest when the registered owners, uh, insurers, their PI Club, Protection and Indemnity Club, gave a conditional letter of guarantee. The conditional letter of guarantee was intended to replace the security of the ship. The ship is the security for the claim. It's under arrest, it can't go up anywhere. And the idea is if you give adequate security, in place of the ship, you can take your ship out of arrest. And the PI Club gave a conditional letter of guarantee. The condition was that the yard had to establish a valid claim against the registered owners, not the device charterers, against the registered owners, and not merely against the charterers, or else they had to establish a maritime lien against the vessel itself. Okay? So the, the owners, uh, insurers, said, um, understandably, we didn't order these repairs. You must either prove that we are nevertheless liable for these repairs, which the charterers ordered, or that the ship is liable because there is a maritime lien against the ship under maritime law. And if you can't prove that, then our guarantee is subject to condition and is not guaranteed. So that's what they wanted. That is the security that they wanted to provide. But if we're liable, the insurers stand behind the owners as security. The letter of uh, guarantee was governed by French law. But the parties decided to debate the issues that arose under French law in England. I don't know why, I suppose it was a sort of compromise. Essentially, three preliminary and, and uh, question was whether this was a valid security for the purposes of the arrest convention, which could earn the vessel its release. Now, three preliminary issues arose. One was, as I've said, for the purposes of the arrest convention, as it was interpreted under French law, were the owners or their vessel answerable for the debt of the charterers? That was an issue that arose under the arrest convention. The second was, for the purposes of adequate security to gain release from arrest, was a conditional security permissible? And in particular, a security subject to the condition which I have just explained. And the third was, for the purposes of the letter of guarantee, was it in fact conditional on the owners of the, or the vessel's liability, or did it answer to the charter's liability? as a matter of interpretation of the guarantee letter. And so the case involved a question of the interpretation of the arrest convention, or perhaps two questions of the interpretation of the arrest convention, and in that context, a question of the interpretation of the guarantee. Now, the matter was debated in the Commercial Court in London. I was the judge. Distinguished French experts gave evidence on French law. So if we have to educate ourselves on foreign law, uh, in, uh, in the courts in London, we get experts on French law to come and give evidence to us. 
And contrary to what would have happened in France if this French law had been debated in the French court, uh, and where there was no binding precedent on the issue at the foreign court, only three rather, I have to confess, unilluminating decisions in the French Court of Cassation and a welter of conflicting jurisprudence in the numerous courts of appeal all around the courts of France. Uh, all the cases were presented to me by the French experts. All the cases were presented to me, which would never have happened in France, together with a large amount of writings of French jurists, which tried to make sense of the conflicting jurisprudence, even though no sense could be made of the conflicting jurisprudence. <laughs> But in France, each court would simply have made up its own mind as to the scope of convention, going back to the wording of convention and saying, this is what the wording of convention is. There is no precedent binding on me. I'm not interested in having 20 cases from courts of appeal around the French coast cited to me, and I'm even less interested in the writings of jurists. I will make up my mind on the text of the convention. That's what would have happened, I was told, in France. But in London, it was done à la style anglaise, so to speak. On the question of contractual interpretation, I was entertained to submissions based, because this was French law, on the negotiations, as well as on the subjective intentions of the parties. So I had evidence from the parties and from their lawyers as to what they were trying to do and trying to achieve and say and so on and so forth. I had all the drafts of the negotiations of the letter of guarantee. The negotiations, in fact, showed that the parties attempted on the one side to obtain an unconditional guarantee and on the other side to provide only a conditional guarantee. What you'd expect negotiations. And so the negotiations helped only to show that both interpretations were theoretically in play. Ultimately, however, the question had to be decided on the wording of the guarantee. And I held that, however wide the admissible evidence of the party's intentions was, the letter of guarantee permitted the owners to argue that under the convention, they, as distinct from the charters, were not obliged to give any security. And then I had to decide um, what the convention allowed. And as for the convention, it emerged that it had been enacted into English law. It was an international convention to which both France and Britain and many, many, many other countries had signed up. But it had been enacted into English law in different terms from its automatic incorporation into French law. So that the issues which arose in the present case could not have arisen in English law. So that was a no assistance to me at all. I considered, again, as I was invited to do, all the French jurisprudence and all the French commentators. I don't think the French court would have done that or been invited to do that, as I said. And I concluded that an owner of a vessel arrested for its charterous debt was entitled to make his security conditional on the owner's or his vessel's liability. I decided to that effect both on the basis of the preponderance of the jurisprudence as analyzed, but in any event on the equity of the situation. As the French expert said, that I was entitled to decide in the absence of binding jurisprudence. So they said, well, there is no binding jurisprudence. You decide what is fair. And that equity was revealed by the fact, as was also common ground between the experts, that the vessel, if left under arrest, could not have been taken in execution of the establishment of the charter of state. So if there, if there had been no alternative security provided, and the vessel had just been left rotting away until the case had been decided by the courts, and then decided on appeal, and then decided for the fourth time in the court of cassation, the ship could not have been taken in execution for the debt of the charter, of the device charter. I was rather influenced by that, but at any rate, I did it à la style anglaise and I did it à la style française. The other case I would mention uh, is the famous case 
uh, well, famous name, Jenny Ray, because it made the Supreme Court look a bit silly. Uh, may not be famous in Poland. Case of Della and the government of Pakistan. Now, Della was uh, a Saudi company which had entered into a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, with the government of Pakistan to acquire land in Mecca and there construct housing for pilgrims performing Hajj. And pursuant to that MOU, Dalla proceeded to enter into a construction agreement, not with the government of Pakistan, but with a trust created by the government of Pakistan. And that was the contract in question. So the MOE, MOU preceded the construction contract. The contract in question was not the MOU, it was the construction contract. The government had been a party to the MOU, the government was not a party to the MOU, the government trust was a party to the MOU. Now, um, and there had been, I should tell you, talk of a government guarantee of the trust, but the government had refused to the guarantee of the trust. Now, unfortunately, the government ordinance which had created the trust lapsed automatically at the end of three months unless it was renewed, which it was not with the result that Della lost its contract partner, the trust, which just disappeared after three months, and it lost its contract. Um, obviously, they weren't well enough advised by the excellent lawyers that you will all become in due course. On the other hand, the Secretary of the Government's Ministry of Religious Affairs, who had also been the Secretary of the Trust's Board, wrote to Della on the Ministry's note paper shortly after the expiry of the Trust to give notice of termination of the contract, citing a failure by Della to submit timely specifications. So there, after the Trust disappeared, was its ex-Secretary, Minister for Religious Affairs, seeking to exercise a right of termination under the contract. The contract contained an arbitration clause, providing for ICC arbitration in Paris. Bella claimed against the ministry, against the government, in arbitration, and the government asserted that it was not a party to the contract or to the arbitration agreement. And so the distinguished tribunal, which included a retired law lord from England, Lord Mustill, rendered an initial award on its jurisdiction. <coughs> found that the government was a party. <coughs> In doing so, the tribunal applied, quote, those transnational principles and usages reflecting the fundamental requirements of justice in international trade and the concept of good faith in business, end quote. The tribunal did so and it decided that it did not need to determine the applicable law of the contract. As for good faith, you will recall that the concept of good faith is an inherent and express part of the civil law. It is to be found, for instance, in Article 4.8 of the Unit of Principles, but I tell you it is not an expressly recognized part of English law. Anyway, having established its jurisdiction under the doctrine of competence, competence, the competence to decide its own competence, the arbitral tribunal in Dalla went on to make a second award against the government for $20 million, and it was that award which was taken to England for enforcement under the New York Convention for the Enforcement of Arbitration Awards. Enter the English courts, enforcement in England, disputed. Enforcement claim came before the Commercial Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court. Each court held that the arbitrators had been wrong to find that the government was a party to the contract and the arbitration agreement, and they therefore refused to enforce the second award. And in doing so, what law were they applying? They were applying French law, about which they were informed in exactly the same way as I had been informed in my case by experts on French law. They applied French law. Why did they apply French law? Because that was mandated by the New York Convention on the ground that that was the law of the country in which the award had been made. It was an ICC award made in Paris. The arbitrators then decided what the proper law of the contract was. They applied transnational principles. 
but it was made in Paris, it was a French award, and therefore when it comes to enforcement under the New York Convention, what is the law you apply? You apply the law of the place where the was made, French law. So the English courts informed themselves of the French law on the question of contract interpretation, and the issue was, was the government a party to the contract to which it was not a party, or which it did not appear to be a party? Of the names party and sign the contract. All the English courts decided, uh, having it was common ground what the French law of interpretation was, and applying that, the English courts, ending in the Supreme Court, decided that as a matter of French law, the government of Pakistan was not a party and therefore the play would not be enforced. Following Dalla's defeat on the question of enforcement in England, Dalla went to France and asked the French court to enforce the arbitration award instead, and they succeeded. They succeeded for the tribute, the tribute de Paris, and they succeeded the court d'appel de, de Paris, and the case wasn't taken to the court de cassation. It's too plain, too simple. Too simple, because the government was part of so there we are, egg on the face of the Supreme Court of, of the United Kingdom, applying French law, got it wrong, all very simple, French courts. And um, it's a very interesting lesson. Okay, I, I was sitting in the, in the Court of Appeal in England, so I got it wrong, French, French law. There we are, a very interesting <laughs> problem. An interesting and informative <coughs> article has been written by uh, uh, Jacob Gresson and Dr. Nerey Tauk respectively an English barrister and a member of the Paris Bar, respectively, although they're both working for American firms in Paris. In their article, they suggest that the difference between the English and the French courts' approaches to the same French law was that the English courts were more influenced by what had happened in the period leading up to the agreement, in particular the replacement of the government by the trust. The government was party to the MOU, wasn't party to the contract, the trust was a party to the contract and was also influenced by the refusal of the government to give a guarantee of the trust, whereas the French courts were more influenced by what had happened after the agreement had been made, such as the involvement of the government, the activity of the trust in performance of the agreement, and the sending of that termination letter on the government's rather than the trust's note paper. They also speculated that sub silentio, I always like a little bit of Latin, sub silentio, although nothing was said about the doctrine of good faith, the doctrine was nevertheless a decisive influence, but nothing was said about good faith in the French courts. Now, uh, if uh, if that's so, then this case shows that English and French courts applying the same law nevertheless do so in different ways, each influenced by their own traditions. Not surprising, perhaps. Slightly disappointing to find that English lawyers can't get into the minds, English judges can't get into the minds of French judges. Perhaps that isn't surprising, but still. The authors of the article suggest that whereas the English common law approach pays more attention to the bargain struck by the parties, the French approach, that was called the civil law approach, will adopt a more holistic approach to search out the just result. But perhaps, perhaps the common law tradition will give you more of a bargain and the civil law will give you more justice. But the businessman, the shipping owner and charterer, and the sellers and buyers of goods and the banks which finance them and the insurers who insure them might well say more of the bargain is more of justice. Bargain is the party's own allocation of risk. Or to put the matter another way, there may be a more objective and a more subjective view of justice. And there is also another possibility. French courts didn't speak about good faith. They were interpreting the contract. But there's yet a third possibility. The arbitration award as I've told you, was not decided under French law, but as I mentioned under those 
quote, transnational legal principles and usages reflecting the fundamental requirements of justice in international trade and concept of good faith in business. French law prides itself on upholding arbitration awards, as does English law, at any rate in the absence of serious lack of due process. And so perhaps the unspoken aspect of French law, which held stay, sway, was its willingness to uphold the award. French law is being prepared to uphold an award which has been set aside by the courts of the award's own seat. And French law is rather famous for that. Anyway, this is an inexhaustible subject, but time marches on, and I would like to encourage you to ask some questions. If you would like to do so, I will try and answer them. So I will leave it there. If you have a question, oh. if you have a question, just pop your hand up, and I'll come and bring a non-functioning microphone to you. Oh no, there we go. Okay, who wants to go first? Are you just moving your fingers to you? Yeah. <laughs> can, can I just start hey, you off? Let's ask the first question, and then others will. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the first question. It seems to me that what I should then say to clients for for cases in England is that since we live in that when we're doing the negotiations, we should just put our telephones on the table, start recording from the very beginning, and then say, so, discuss, discussing clause, clause six, do you, do you mean this? And then get the other side to say yes, and then I'll just play that tape back to the court when we have a dispute about it later. Is that, is that right? <laughs> well, that sounds like a good idea, if you're, <laughs> civil, if you're in the civil law. But of course, the whole trouble is that parties will answer the question with a whole lot of verbiage, which will make the question of interpretation even harder. So at the end of the day, you have a clause to interpret, and that will be hard enough. Now, if you have to start interpreting what people are saying to one another, <laughs> on paper, I mean, we, we think we understand one another as we speak to one another. I don't know how we do it. Because when you look to see the transliteration of what we say to one another on any complicated subject. It's almost impossible to understand what we are saying to one another, and yet we understand one another. So I think that although, in a sense, if people answered the questions briefly, honestly, and articulately, you might get a clue if there was <laughs> agreement on both sides, practical uh, answer would be you would just have a more difficult question of interpretation than you've got with one clause. Thanks. Uh, under common law, are the parties allowed to change or set out their own rules of contract interpretation? And would the courts respect such rules? Yes, I'm sure they can. I mean, the parties are I've used the word autonomous, the parties are in control of their contract. They can, uh, I mean, when you use a definition in a contract, you're setting up your own rule of contract interpretation. The commonest problem of, of using definitions is that very often definitions are given capital letters, right? So when you, when you, draft, con when you draft contracts, you'll, give your, you'll probably give your definitions capital letters. And then every time you use that definition in the contract, you'll use it with capital letters. Sometimes you'll forget to put the capital letters in, and you'll have a definitional phrase used with lower, with lower case of capital letters, and then you have a, a then you have a problem of contract interpretation uh, straight away. But yes, definitions are the parties' own rules of contract interpretation. Uh, sometimes the con sometimes a well drafted contract will state what the purposes of the contract. Ah, and that is a form of rules of contract interpretation. But I don't think you'll find uh, I don't think you'll find any very high level rules of contract interpretation. I mean you won't have you won't have after the six of the Code Napoleon set out there. Uh, you will have the parties of course saying uh, this contract will be uh, um, interpreted uh, uh, 
on the in the shlom or per shlom, for that. That's setting up a rule of contract interpretation in brief. And you could say it, say anything you want, and then the court would apply it. Yes. Because uh, rules of contract interpretation are not mandatory rules of law. You can, you can, you can have any contract you want, except uh, an um, unlawful one. Okay? There's a question over here. Um, I have a question about the spirit of independence yes. uh, case. Um, why would an English court be concerned about French case law um, at all? Uh, well, I think that uh, as a matter of principle, uh, well, the only reason we were looking at French law at all is because the letter of agreement was decided was uh, a French law contract. Right, so you have to look at French law. So we look at French. We were looking at French law because the contract told us to look at French law. Would French law look at uh, French jurisprudence? It wouldn't. And if that's what you're asking, right, right, I made that clear. It wouldn't. So why were we looking at it? Because because we were conducting this in London, and the lawyers on both sides thought that the English judge would need a little bit of help uh, in the way the French judge wouldn't, and one side starts putting in expert evidence of one kind, so the other side starts putting in expert evidence of the other kind, and before you, before you turn around, you've got what the Americans call a federal case. Okay? But uh, your, your question is, is, uh, is, is well directed. Sure. Uh, if, if I may, I'm sorry, this is, this is slightly arbitration uh, focused in the, in the Dalla award. Uh, the arbitration tribunal decided that transnational principles of law were applicable to determine the dispute. Um, did they determine that that was to be taken to be the intention of the parties, uh, that transnational principles should be applied? And well, if so, sorry, um, if so, should that be the frame of reference for determining whether um, the award was valid, whether uh, Pakistan was really a party to the award when it came time for review under the New York Convention? Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether the, the law that the parties have submitted, um, that have, have applied to their uh, dispute, is the first stop option. And then in the absence of that, uh, you look at the law of the seat, the, the law of the award. Um, and if so, should you have perhaps look through, take, you know, given merit to the decision of the arbitral tribunal and look through the lens of transnational principles to find validity? That, that, that's a very good question. Well, I think uh, we, we had to go through French law because that was the direction of the New York Convention, right? There was an enforcement situation, and in that situation you are told to go to the law of the seat. So we had to go through French law. Now, could French law have taken us back to those transnational principles which the arbitration uh, tribunal uh, decided to apply? I suppose it might have done, but that's not the way in which the argument went, either in uh, Britain or in France. But, but perhaps, it might, perhaps it might have done. There are all kinds of interesting arguments which might have arisen but didn't arise. For instance, having debated the question of who was a contract, whether the government was a contract party in enforcement proceedings in England, you might say, and I think an English court would say, if the matter had been reversed, suppose they'd gone to France, and uh, fr the French court had said the government is not a party. And then secondly, they come to England for enforcement. And the same question has arisen. I think an English court would say, <coughs> what are you doing? You have, uh, you have debated this issue in France under French law. That's what we would have to do in England under French law, because that's what the New York Convention tells you to do. And you've already got your answer in French law from a very good French court. 
So this is issue estoppel, this is raised judicata. Uh, we're not going to entertain the same argument again in England. I think that's what an English court would have said. The French court uh, doesn't. The French court says uh, enforcement is an entirely new proceeding wherever it begins. You try to enforce in Britain, irrelevant. You try to uh, enforce in France, we'll look at it day then. But all these interesting questions uh, could, could have arisen. But they, they didn't. Enough, enough questions, dear. <laughs> I've, for, for many years, I, I've lived in Poland, and, and it's been very easy to say to not just but living in Poland. Years, I <laughs> but but there've been certain questions, such as, can you have acceptance by silence? No. Can you have penalty clauses in English law? No. Is there good faith in English law? No. And then, as the years have gone on, maybe uh, I've become more Polish. Uh, I'm, I'm drifting in that direction. But it seems that English law. The answer to those three questions has become far more blurred, and that, well, sometimes we can have acceptance by silence in conditions that Polish people tell me are very reflective of Polish law. And, well, elements of good faith are starting to be mentioned more and more by the higher courts. And penalty clauses, we don't call them that, but they're getting close in commercial. So an argument could be made that English law is becoming more Polish. Um, <laughs> Is, is, the, is that true? Is that, maybe I'm just I'm, I'm becoming more proud and Polish the longer I live here. Um, but is, is that true? And if so, what, what is it that's pushing a change to certain what would have been core elements of, of I think English all, I think we're all growing close to one another because we all um, uh, find out much more about how we, we do things. Uh, in, a, um, in a world which is smaller, uh, and closer and more transnational and international, uh, we are all looking with great interest uh, at what each other are doing and comparing notes. Um, and that's a very good process, and that enables us to talk, as I've done this evening, in terms of each other's laws. Um, but whether there is anything fundamentally different going on, um, I'm done for. Uh, the law is an odd thing. Um, I give another lecture called Principle and Pragmatism. Uh, is the law driven by principle? Academics would certainly say yes. Civil lawyers would certainly say yes. Or is it driven by pragmatism? Or what you might call the facts? as con lawyers would say. Con lawyers say, uh, give me the facts and I will build up the law from a series of cases on the facts. I will go from the bottom and move upwards to find principles which I will constantly be subjecting to development and analysis and qualification and so forth as new factual problems arise and distinguished courts think about those problems and speak about them. And that's how the common law develops its principles. To bar or no, from, from the bottom to the top. Civil law says no, put all the finest heads together in a room, professors of academe, great judges, and let's have a code and we'll have We'll have principles of law of the highest level, and everything will descend from the principles. We won't have we won't have precedent. Some civil some, some civil countries do have precedent. On the whole, we won't have precedent, and everything will go back to principle, and everything is from the top and descends. And here are two systems, two great systems of law, which operate in diametrically opposed ways. And they all meet in the middle, because it turns out that by and large, the, both civil and common law traditions come to the same conclusions on the same factual basis, I bet. Uh, not always, not always. Difficult cases which lie in the middle may be influenced by the fact that you're moving in one direction or in the other direction. 
and so forth, that that is so. Um, but I suspect that for the most part we meet in the middle and we decide the same factual problems in the same way. We may express our principles in slightly different ways. Um, so we in Britain say we don't have a law of good faith. We have lots of other laws which are designed to deal with problems of bad faith. But they are different principles. They are smaller principles, not one great not one great high principle of good faith, as we should do. It sounds like a very good principle. I think sure on good faith as well. Um, but we've never dared go there. We think it's all a bit too subjective. We start, start saying to judges that they can decide cases as a matter of good faith, and who knows where you are. We've always been a bit suspicious of that. So we like our mini principles. Uh, civil law starts with great high-level principle of good faith, and then they have to decide whether it works in this situation or that situation or the other situation. And I'm told by my civil law friends that whereas the civil law starts with a great, a great principle of good faith, they say, but not here, 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 but here, here, and here, and here, and they have to explain why it's here, and why it's here, and why it's not there. And it's all a bit like the common law. So, as we move together, we like the sound of good faith, and we talk about it. Some judges like to talk about it a bit more. Some judges say it's very dangerous. But we talk about it. And there we are. We move, we move together. It's a very nice thing. And we learn from one another. So. Um, I don't want this question to be political at all, but you have mentioned some of the systems have converged together. Uh, do you think that Brexit could reverse this trend somehow, that the British system will now not be influenced by both European law and uh, continental law as so. such? That's a very, very interesting question. So in the European Union, you have two uh, systems of law. By far the great majority is uh, civil law, but there is Britain and the United Kingdom and I think Malta with the common law. Um, and we've been learning from one another, and I think we do learn from one another, and I think this is a wonderful and very, very useful process. Um, the, 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 um, the basic civil law of uh, European community law which of course started off with six nations, all civil law, civil law nations, doesn't always fit very well with common law. I've had myself to, to wrestle with uh, judgments of the European Court of Justice, which are also part of the English law, and try to apply them to English legal situations, and it can be very, very difficult. I've tried to deal with the law of agency, for instance, uh, in the context of uh, European law, we've referred a problem to the European Court of Justice, we've had an answer from the European Court of Justice, and when you would try to apply the answer to the European Court of Justice, it doesn't really work with the English common law notions of the law agency. And all you can do, really, at the end of the day, is to say, Despite the fact that the European Court of Justice tried to stand back and not tell the English court how this should be applied, in truth, you can see that they think it ought to be applied in one way or the other, and perhaps you never do that. Um, anyway, the process of learning from one another is, uh, is, good, is good. What will happen after Brexit? Well, I think that after Brexit, there will be uh, less... Uh, talk and debate about common and civil law between members of the same family at the same luncheon table, and that will probably be a sad thing. On the other hand, in one way or the other, I think these discussions will go on. Um, uh, I am not and I voted to remain, but I'm not altogether sad that the common law of Britain will, um, after Brexit, um, 
stand on its own feet, as it were. Um, every nation has to look to its own uh, history, um, and the common law of Britain is um, is a decent thing, a good thing in British terms, and for it to be um, undermined by trying to conflate uh, a different system into it um, is uh, not, not necessarily uh, the best of things. So I think there, I think in sum, my answer to the question is I think there'll be less talk together, uh, which is sad, um, but uh, perhaps a bit more purity for the common law, and it will go its own way. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, our, law, our laws will change somewhat uh, as we disengage from European law. Uh, I don't think they'll change all that much, because I suspect that a great deal of the European law will be enacted in English law as part of Brexit. Um, but yeah, there'll, be, there'll be changes of detail after that. And we'll continue to learn from one another on good things and mistakes as well. Very interesting question. Okay, just, just with a mindful of the time, I think perhaps uh, I should wrap this up. It, it, it feels as if that was set up for me because the words Britain, learning, and good things were all mentioned in the last sentence. So I should begin where I finished off by saying there's one thing about Britain that's not changing, but still very, very good, and involves learning a lot of interesting things, and it's on that poster over there. Um, but to, to, to say uh, the thing that really I'm about to say at the end, is uh, I think that I haven't seen a better advertisement for uh, the common law or for the English legal system in terms of the, the fluency, the lucidity, and, and the comprehensibility of, of everything that Sir Bernard has said this evening. I feel like I've, I've learned a lot, and uh, I hope that you feel the same way too, and that you'll say thank you in the traditional way. It's been a pleasure, and, and it's, it's a double pleasure because Sir Bernard has also agreed to speak tomorrow evening on, on a different topic which will be about civil procedure reform. I, I mentioned earlier that he was instrumental in terms of introducing fairly radical reforms into the English legal system, and as far as I'm aware, there is some discussion in Poland about changes to, to civil procedure, so um, I hope that we'll see you tomorrow and that we can discuss uh, and compare uh, what the UK has done, what England and Wales has done, uh, with some things that uh, might be happening in the future in Poland. So, have a good evening. Thanks for coming, and I hope to see you again. Tomorrow.